Well, we're falling very short. And of course, one of the tragedies is, is that it's one of the most powerful testimonies possible. Because if all the world is fragmenting on the basis of race, and we show that you can unite on the basis of race, you've got to go, what's going on there? And what's the trick behind that? And the trick behind that is God, if we pay attention to what God has designed for us to do and be. That's why the New Testament speaks about the result of salvation in Ephesians 2 being being the creation of the one new man, which is Jew and Gentile together. So if we ask, why should we be saved? Some people think, well, it's just to go to heaven. Well, that's nice. And yes, we can check that box. But beyond that, it is to show that God has brought together peoples who were formerly estranged to be able to relate to one another in the way he originally created us to be. God TV family, it's not often that you get to meet a proper theologian, somebody who has not only dedicated themselves to the study and the understanding of God's word, but through his books and publications, allows us to share in some of that insight. Will you welcome today, Dr. Daryl Bock. Welcome to the program today, sir. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. You're here as part of the Chosen People Conference on finding shalom in a troubled world. What will you be adding to this conference today? Well, my role has been to introduce the conference, introduce the theme of the conference, and to give people an overview about the kinds of peace that the scripture offers to people. On the one hand, there's the peace that we're all familiar with, which is the offer of a relationship with God that puts us on a, on a kind of on his wavelength, if I can say it that way, and that allows us to be at peace with what goes around us because we know we're in the hands of a loving, caring, and gracious God. But the other part of what I'm going to do is talk about how that peace also involves a cosmic element that uh, Israel as a nation among the nations brought in peace together, uh, a transnational community that gets formed of people who uh, worship God together, and the ultimate peace that is the opposite of the way our world functions today, of course, where the nations kind of grind against each other and work against each other, and there's a lot of pressure in the world. Looking forward to a day when Christ comes back. They all recognize who, who God is, what he has done, uh, what the Spirit does in the people's lives, and then, and then on the basis of that, live eternally in an environment in which uh, they are able to enjoy the presence of God and enjoy the presence of one another. One of the things that we were talking just before we came on air is about this sense that it is peace within community. And when Ephesians 2.10 talks about that we are his workmanship, it's not just a role that we have personally, but that that workmanship is worked out among others. Please tell us more. Yeah, in fact, what's interesting is the term that's used biblically is the term one new man. Most people misunderstand this term. They think about the new man and the old man, and they think, oh, that's something going on inside of me, and there's this war between who I was and who I'm supposed to be, and they see it as kind of this huge wrestling match that's going on spiritually within us. That's not what that passage means. There's a parallel passage in Colossians 3 that talks about in the, man, in the new man there are no uh, barbarians or Scythians, uh, and, and so that's people groups. So we're talking about a community that's made up of a variety of people groups. I go to the doctor and he looks inside of me, he doesn't go, you know, Daryl, the problem you've got, you've got too many barbarians and Scythians in there. We just clean them out, you'll be feeling healthy. No, barbarians and Scythians are part of a community that you're a part of on the external side. And you're identifying with the fact that you're in Christ, you're not in Adam, which means that you, you recognize you're a saint and you represent people who share in this belief of God. And so you live in a certain way, you ha have a certain way you carry yourself as a result. And all of that is communal. All of that is corporate. And the tr problem we have in the West is we think of ourselves so individualistically that we've lost this corporate view of, of our identity. And the Bible is very centered on how we are actually connected to one another. When I call you brother, or I call uh, uh, a female saint uh, uh, a sister, I'm actually talking about the fact that we're familiarly connected in what we share before the living God. And the way I carry myself also is a reflection on what it means for you to be a Christian, and I take that responsibility seriously. Uh, Jeremiah 31 talks about the fact that the Lord will take our stony hearts away and give us beautiful soft hearts of flesh. 
Is that part of the Lord's work of sanctification or transformation that will bring us to this place? It's both. It's both. It's both transformation and sanctification. Sanctification means you're set apart and you've been set apart. The moment you're justified and you're covered by the work of Christ and you're declared righteous, you're made into a saint. I, I tell sainthood works exactly backwards from the way people think about it. People think about saints become people becoming saints because of their track record. Okay, no, people become saints because God has touched their lives in the very beginning. So they're saint from the very beginning. And then that transformation does take place. That sanctification part comes after justification. It, I'm being set apart and I'm, and I'm more and more being shaped and formed in the likeness of Christ. So that's a process. So this is not an either or, it's a both and. And uh, by, I often tease my students that sometimes we set ourselves up for trouble in theology because we set up a question as an either or, and a lot of times that either or is actually a both and. Paul promises us in Philippians 4 that we can walk in a peace that passes or surpasses what we understand. The theme of this conference is finding that peace in a troubled world. How do we walk in the peace that passes what we know? I think we rest in the gifts that God has given us. Ephesians 1.3 says that God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ, which means that we have everything that we need to be able to walk with him now. We don't have to find anything more, anything in addition, everything that we need to be spiritually successful, God has provided in the grace gift that he's given us through our salvation. If we'll draw on the resources that, that he gives us, and this is just a huge treasure trove of blessing that he, uh, that he throws our way, then we will be able to walk with him and rejoice, even in the midst of the pressure that is a part of living in a messy, fallen world. We're going to hear a lot of speakers today talk about many aspects of finding shalom. When you come to a conference such as this, and, and you do, as you say, get this treasure trove of blessings, this treasure trove of insight into God's genuine plan for our lives, how do we steward it? What do we take away? What, how do we either write it down or, or, or make it a part of each one of our lives? So it's not just an event that we attended, but it's actually a moment of transformation in each one of our days. I think we have to, in our mindset, take on an approach that says, I'm going to be positive about what it is that God has given me. I think that most people live in a place in which they see how things don't align, perhaps to their expectations or aspirations, and just trust that they're in the hands of a living God and that in the midst of the hands of a living God, there's a lot to be positive about and to be, and to be grateful for what has been received and for the potential of what that represents. And then rest in the fact that God has us in his caring and loving hands. And even when we go through trial and God doesn't say we're not going to go through trial, that trials will come, that he is there with us and to remember that when God holds my hand, I'm in good hands. How can we be praying for you? The work that you do is life-changing for those who follow, for those who read, but you have a key role among us as a Christian community. How can we pray for you? Just pray that I would be uh, effective in, in the way in which I try and encourage and minister to people through um, talking about what the Word teaches, but also in thinking through relationally how we need to be healthy in the way we walk with God. I often say that when you believe the Bible like we do, we're often so focused on being right that sometimes relationally we're weak. And if we're right, but we're relationally wrong, we're still wrong. So I wanna be relationally right. We know that you're working on a series of books about race and the church. It's one of those hot topics right now. And for so many of us, we're struggling to get an understanding of what the Lord would say about different colors, races, and, and, and how we as the church can be Jesus at this time. How is the Lord leading you to speak on this subject? Well, I think it's very important to understand that in Revelation 5, etc., there is the idea that people from every tribe and every nation will gather together to worship the Lord. The church is a transnational institution and, and organization or community, however you want to express it. And, and so thinking about who I might be sitting next, next to in heaven who would be very different from me on the one hand, but we share our commitment to God on the other is worth pursuing. And so thinking about how to model that 
in a world in which race is a divisive topic as opposed to a uniting topic, allows the church access to a window that shows that God is really at work in the church by the way we interact with one another. So does that mean if we're separated in our church attendance that we all look the same, sound the same, come from the same place, that we may actually be missing one of the great joys of the ecclesia of God? Uh, precisely, that, that when we segregate ourselves and it's, let's be honest, it's comfortable to be around people that you're like. Sure. Um, we, actually, we actually lose one of the things that's beautiful about salvation, which is that God brought together estranged people and said, you're going to be brothers and sisters. He did it originally with a group called Jews and Gentiles who did not get along and didn't want to have very much to do with one another and said, I'm going to make you family and let's watch how this goes. And in fact, this is one of the great ironies, the New Testament itself is actually a discussion about how to make that happen. Mm. And most people don't even aware of that. And so uh, it, most of the issues that are discussed are the issues that come from the tensions of Gentiles coming from one place and Jews coming from another yes. place and saying, we want you to be together and to live as a family and to show the world that it's possible for people of very diverse backgrounds to actually function together and to reflect the reconciliation that God brings because reconciliation ultimately is not a two-way street. It's a triangle. It's a triangle between God, myself, and others. In John 13, Jesus said that they, the world, will know him through the love that we have for one another. How short are we falling of that great Well, we're falling very short. And of course, one of the tragedies is, is that it's one of the most powerful testimonies possible. Because if all the world is fragmenting on the basis of race, and we show that you can unite on the basis of race, you've got to go, what's going on there? And what's the trick behind that? And the trick behind that is God, if we pay attention to what God has designed for us to do and be. That's why the New Testament speaks about the result of salvation in Ephesians 2 being being the creation of the one new man, which is Jew and Gentile together. So if we ask, why should we be saved? Some people think, well, it's just to go to heaven. Well, that's nice. And yes, we can check that box. But beyond that, it is to show that God has brought together peoples who were formerly estranged to be able to relate to one another in the way he originally created us to be. Because he originally created us to be made in the image of God, to subdue the earth and be fruitful and multiply. And if we were fruitful and multiplying, we were going to produce nations, etc. And we were all supposed to get along and steward the creation well. Of course, we all know it's dysfunctional now, but the only way back to the way the original design is, is to do it through what Jesus Christ offers. And the testimony of the church says that God is at work. What can we do practically? I live in some town with some community. Most of them look like me. Some of them don't look like me. What, however, that's replicated around the world. From the research that you've done, from the insight that you've been given, from the book that you're working on, what are the practical steps, some ABCs that we can do to make a difference, to walk more towards that transnational expression of the church? Get to know people who are different than you are. Get close to them. Uh, take the time to get to know them. One of the books that I'm working on is actually a biography by an African-American woman who grew up in the Deep South whose personal growth experience was very different than my own, lived in a different socioeconomic context, went through a series of experiences I would be very unlikely to go through in suburbia. And I am a side voice, and we're in conversation with one another as she tells her story. And I'm trying to be a listener to what it is that she's gone through, to try and understand the background that she came from and why she responds in certain ways to things that she does. And we've, we are work colleagues, so we've gotten to know each other in this context, and we've decided to, to formalize in a book. That's one effort. The second is an, an effort to actually articulate the theology of race that's in the Bible, which I don't think we have entirely developed. And then the third book is to talk about uh, 23 public spaces with people representing five ethnicities, all giving their take on what it means to be who they are in that space. And the give and take is designed to show us why people see different spaces differently. Why don't we study the word more? Oh, that's a great question. I think that um, many people are very, very distracted in their lives with the millions of things that are going on and the things that are available to them. So to actually sit down and get some quiet time 
in order to engage um, requires a little bit of discipline and management of the variety of things that people are asked to do today with the distances that they have to travel and the variety of things that they have to do. I think that's um, one reason. Of course, that ends up being an excuse because it's an issue of prioritization and what you think is important. You find time to do things that you think are important. How and I the, think that's the problem. How did the Lord grab your attention? Uh, you've, you've literally dedicated your life to the study of his word. You've written some extraordinary books and exegesis, which I probably said wrong, uh, so, that, so that the rest of us can learn from the wisdom the Lord's given you. But how did the Lord first grab your heart and grab your attention? Well, it's interesting. When I was a child, I had developed a discipline uh, I wasn't a believer, but I developed a discipline of working on things that I loved for an hour and a half to two hours a day, because I used to figure out uh, batting averages, American, okay, batting averages on a slide rule and keep a uh, wow. log of players for the team that I, that I uh, supported. And so I was used to cutting out a couple of hours every day to do some serious work on something that I cared about, and that discipline literally carried over into when I became a believer in college, decided I was going to study theology, et cetera. And that discipline actually became the discipline around which I developed the ability to spend 90 minutes to two hours every day writing. And uh, so, yeah, so it's uh, I, I, one of my closest friend's mothers who knew me growing up it jokes with me now about the batting averages that I used <laughs> to keep and rolls. what they were for and that God knew what he was doing. So, yeah. if, if we could all sit at the front of your class, if, if we finally put our phones away, mm -hmm. if you finally had our attention as, as members of the body of Christ around the world, even the members of the God TV family, if we sat at your chair for an hour, what would you love us to know about the word? That the word is um, deep and and searchless, by which I mean not that you can't search it, but it's endless in terms of what it will yield as you search it. Uh, and if you come at it with an open heart and a curious mind, uh, it, has, it has wonders to tell you about how to approach life. Mm. The Lord not only grabbed your heart and your attention for the things of his word, but also for the things of the people of Israel and understanding that he really still does have a covenant with the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a misunderstood portion or central key of the Word of God. How can we regain that revelation as members of the body? Well, I think it's important to understand that God made certain commitments to Israel from the very beginning that he said were forever. And if his word means anything, then forever means something. And then so appreciate the fact that it's, it means something to the people who were originally receiving the promise and what that means for us is if God is faithful to them, he'll be faithful to us. Amen. How can we grow in our sense that the Lord has a plan, not just for Israel, not just for these great promises of, of Scripture, but indeed he has a plan for each one of our lives? Well, each person is made uniquely. Uh, the Bible speaks about each of us being give, given a gift to use for the sake of the body and the building up of the body, which means each of us has a place to fit and to find. Uh, unfortunately, many people don't make an effort to find their place in the church. They think of the church like a consumer does. What can the church do for me? Uh, when in fact, God has equipped people to do something for the people of the church and for the people of the world through that. And so to the extent that I recognize how I'm gifted and what it is I'm supposed to be about, I put myself in a position to be uh, to be a reflection of the unique way God has made me in his image for sure, which I share with everybody else, but with that unique mix of combination that makes me different than you and different than the people I live next to and different from the people who are across the world from me um, and, and give a sense of direction and balance to, uh, to what my life's supposed to be about. As an academic and as a theologian, um, many of us are struggling with the fact that we no longer as a society consider God's word as God's word. How can we as the body of Christ, how can we as the body, as the God TV family, how can we be praying for you and your colleagues that in many ways you do the study to lead us well? 
Well, I, I, you know, when I was writing the variety of books that I wrote, I would think about who I was writing for. And uh, I often get emails from people literally from around the world saying, you know, I read your book and I just dropped you a note to thank you. And I always say back in response, I write for people like you. I write for people who desire to understand what's going on with the Word of God, taking the time to sit down and listen to another voice about what that word may be saying. And so the best prayer that you can give to me and other academics is that we do our, our work with an eye to the people we're writing for, okay? Uh, I not only wanna be clear, I not only wanna be accurate with regard to the word, but I wanna touch people with what's being said in a way that says, this is what God may be saying to you. And so my prayer is that people who pick up what I write will have open eyes and ears and that they might be able and willing to receive what it is that's being said and then that someone does the sifting that's necessary because some of what I say may not be quite on target and they need to be aware of that too. Dr. Darrell Bach, thank you so much for joining us today. Very well.